Good morning, everyone. I'm Carlos Cubia, Vice President and Chief Global Diversity Officer of Walgreen Boots Alliance. Let me begin by thanking Reverend Floyd Flake and Reverend Elaine Flake and the Greater Allen AME Cathedral of New York. Also, Reverend Stephen Green for hosting this urgently important and timely conference. Walgreens is honored to be a part of this gathering as we join in celebrating Juneteenth and in recognizing how the long struggle for emancipation is very far from over. There's an old saying, when America catches a cold, the black community comes down with double pneumonia. Unfortunately, that's truer than ever. As America struggles through the pandemic and economic crisis, our community is hardest hit. Adding insult to injury is the ongoing legacy of racial injustice. Our first panel today, from pain to protest to policy, will focus on turning anger and passion into action. We have a remarkable group of panelists to discuss both the problems and the opportunities for progress. I'm here today virtually, not only to open this panel, but for a personal and professional reason. Like many other companies, Walgreen shares the sadness and sense of injustice felt by so many about the tragic death of George Floyd and the disturbing pattern of similar incidents across the United States. We have affirmed our support for the communities of color who have been so profoundly affected by this incident and others like it. And we absolutely denounce hatred, racism, stereotyping, and bigotry in any form. In fact, it's core to our mission to serve communities of color and advance equality in healthcare. And it's my job as Chief Diversity Officer to make sure we live up to our commitment to diversity, inclusiveness, equal treatment, and safety of all people. That includes our 230,000 plus team members and the 8 million customer interactions and patients we see every day. We have a range of initiatives to make our commitment real, from anti-bias training, to ensuring vendor and supplier diversity, to mandating a strong representation of women and people of color in our leadership ranks. But as racial injustice continues, more than ever, we recognize we all need to do more and turn our commitment into even greater action. We're in it for the long haul. So we need to listen and learn and adapt solutions from the best and the brightest minds and passionate hearts. That is why I'm so excited to join with you today, to listen and to take what I learned back to Walgreens so we can do even more and be better. I hope everyone gets as much out of today's panel as I plan to. And with that, I thank you again and let me turn it over to Reverend Watley for what I am sure will be a dynamic and impactful discussion. Good morning, everyone. I'm Pastor Matthew Watley, and I'm pleased to be with you here today, moderating this important session and the last month in response to the police killings of Ms. Breonna Taylor and Mr. George Floyd. Uh, our nation has seen uprisings uh, to protest the systemic racism embedded within our nation's policing system. The murder of Mr. Floyd and Ms. Taylor in the wake of so many others uh, reignited a deep sorrow and anger that the black community has felt time and time again. Police violence against black bodies is not a new phenomenon, but the age of camera phones and social media has allowed us to shine a spotlight on this critical issue. People no longer have the option to look away and we cannot let them. The goal of this panel is to move us from pain to protest to policy that brings real change for black lives. As people of faith, we ultimately trust in the God of the universe who always sides with the oppressed and animates us towards justice and freedom. During this panel, we're going to explore the complexity of reforming policing highlight the barriers to ensuring accountability and justice for bad cops, and discuss opportunities to get civically engaged and demand much needed policy changes at the local, state, and federal level. And for that purpose, uh, we have assembled uh, an august group of uh, African-American leaders who have uh, proven themselves to be equal to the task of bringing justice and leadership already in this season. So glad to welcome the Honorable Angela Also Brooks, the first female county executive of Prince George's County in Maryland. Uh, she also is the former state's attorney for Prince George's County where she served 
two terms. We also are excited to have the Honorable Kamala Harris, who is the US, U.S. Senator for California and also served as uh, the Attorney General for the state of California. Uh, also first, uh, Spencer Overton, President of the Joint Center for, Pol for Political and Economic Studies, which was founded in 1970, uh, which is America's black think tank. And uh, Brother Overton also is a law professor at George Washington University. And finally, Dr. Robert, uh, Robert Roger Mitchell, uh, Chief Medical Examiner for the District of Columbia, and also serves uh, the National Association of Medical Examiners uh, on their board that, that focuses on those who have uh, succumbed to gun violence. And so I actually wanted to start with you, Dr. Mitchell, because uh, in your role as chief medical examiner, you have sort of a keen position to see how the culture of in investigation around officer involved killings uh, unfolds and how oftentimes it unfolds not to bring persons to justice. And certainly we're seeing even now in the case of Mr. George Floyd, different coroner's reports uh, from those that were filed from uh, on behalf of the department versus those that were filed uh, on behalf of the family. So can you help us to understand uh, how that happens and what that looks like from your vantage point? Thank you, Reverend Bartley. And it's just such a pleasure to be on, on this uh, panel with such a, a esteemed colleagues. Um, as you stated, I'm a forensic pathologist, medical examiner, one of very few black forensic pathologists in the chief position in the country. Um, I had the opportunity to uh, author the Sentinel paper on deaths in custody uh, with the National Association of Medical Examiners where we highlight how these cases need to be uh, handled by coroners and medical examiners in the country. Um, just to give you some context, there's deaths in custody occur over uh, over phases. There's the pre-arrest pre, pre -arrest, and then there's the arrest related, then there's in custody, and then there is incarceration or in jail. And so that arrest related or pre-arrest related is where we find George Floyd. And it's important to note that because Bobby Scott put out a deaths in custody um, uh, policy, HR 1447, that requires all deaths in custody to be reported um, to, to the federal government. What we're asking for at the National Medical Association is for uh, it to be included as a, a box on the U.S. standard death certificate, not to ask for law enforcement to report on themselves, but the practitioners like me who certify death for a living should be responsible for checking the box and establishing cause and manner of death and then allow the public health infrastructure to be the place where we look for this data. Um, that is woefully inadequate. As far as George Floyd and in, in the context, you know, there's no uniformity of practice surrounding all medical legal death investigation in the country. So you can get a different diagnosis depending on what county you live in. Um, uh, let me be clear, George Floyd, if I were to certify that death, it would be um, asphyxia due to neck compression. His manner of death would be homicide. Um, the lengthy kind of uh, explanatory type of cause that was established in Hennepin County is one that you may see uh, in different parts of the country. Um, I believe that it, it serves to, to, to be a bit confusing um, to a lay jury that ultimately is going to have to decide this case. Um, and so we need to be worried about um, uniformity of practice within death investigation within this country. And we need to ensure that people understand that just because it's worded a bit differently uh, doesn't mean that he didn't die at the knee of the law enforcement officer um, that, ha that had him pinned down, nor at the guise of the three additional officers that watched him die. So, um, so just to summarize the, the, the question, there are phases um, across of a continuum um, it's important to understand not just arrest related or pre-arrest related, but how many people are dying incarcerated, right? From the natural disease like diabetes and hypertension. People are going to jail and it's a death sentence because of their natural disease and the in inadequate care that they're getting while in prison. I know that's outside of the scope of this conversation, but it's important to understand that our people are dying in prison 
um, at a higher rate uh, than others, as well as while they're getting arrested at a higher rate from a different cause, a different manner, but all along the same continuum. So happy to have additional discussion uh, with many of you, uh, how we can develop policy uh, for the health and safety of, of our people in this country. I really appreciate you expanding the scope of the conversation because that's exactly what we saw uh, in terms of the outbreak of the pandemic, that uh, higher rates of morbidity uh, were in fact just more um, remnants of systemic racism uh, that continues to put us at risk in ways that others simply are not and is uh, meted out in our own health challenges. So I appreciate you uh, bringing up, bring that up and we'll certainly circle back to that. I also wanted to pivot to uh, County Executive Also Brooks uh, because she serves in a unique role, both because of her experience as state's attorney and now in, as County Executive. Uh, I wanna hear from you sort of the embedded challenges that you have uh, experienced trying to better policing, as well as even trying to uh, pursue prosecution of, of bad policing, uh, because we know that because of the agreements that are that are made in, in contract between the union and the county, uh, as well as uh, some of the regulations that you're restricted. A lot of times, what is obvious on video is not as easily uh, sought or or really uh, achieved in court for some of the reasons that Dr. Mitchell just mentioned. But I'm sure you know others. I'd be very interested to hear your. Okay. Well, thank you. First of all, thank you so much, Pastor Watley, um, for hosting today. I'm excited to be a part of this panel. And the truth of the matter, I'm, I'm excited to be alive during a time where I believe we have a true opportunity to create a future that we may never see for our kids. And so this is a wonderful time. Now, I wanna add one thing to what you mentioned. You mentioned that I've been lucky enough to be um, both state's attorney here in my county. I'm now uh, the county executive, but I have to also tell you that my family came to Prince George's County as a result of my great grandfather's murder uh, at the hands of a sheriff's deputy on July 4th of 1956. Wow. He was killed there, left on the side of the road, and my family was told quite simply, uh, and that's my mother, grandmother, and a number of other relatives, that if they didn't leave, they'd kill the whole family. So my family moved uh, to Prince George's County, Maryland, on July 19th of that same year, um, and that's the way that we came here. And so, so I have that additional part of the history um, that has really informed my perspective on what we are uh, dealing with. As state's attorney, the one thing that is, is abundantly clear, and the senator will tell you she's, she's wonderful in, uh, in, in talking with me about this as a young prosecutor, is that you cannot police a community that does not trust you. Mm -hmm. Trust is fundamental to safety. Trust is fundamental to being able to really police these communities. And one of the things that we did early on, I did as a prosecutor, uh, was to create a unit called Special Prosecution Unit, which meant every single time an officer discharged his weapon, uh, or was involved in use of force, we reviewed that and investigated uh, that particular incident every single time, created a system um, that would ensure the public that there was but one system of justice, uh, which meant that our police officers, it didn't matter who you were, a police officer, um, any other person in our community, that, uh, that if you committed a crime in our county, you would be prosecuted, investigated, and prosecuted. And this was critically important uh, and making sure that we not only prosecuted, but that we dealt with officers who were found to be dishonest. There was a list that we created, uh, a flagged officer list that means that if you were uh, implicated in any way, uh, that you were found to be dishonest, that you uh, gave uh, testimony that was dishonest, there was something dishonest in your police report, we flagged that. Uh, not only did we use that in terms of deciding whether or not we would actually, uh, how we would prosecute that case or whether we would prosecute the case, uh, but we immediately provided as well to the defense attorney uh, that there was some question we had about that officer's credibility. And so uh, transparency is very important. Accountability was very, very important. Uh, again, that we did not hesitate uh, to make sure we held accountable officers who crossed the line. Uh, and the other part of it is that you cannot, uh, even as a prosecutor, you cannot limit uh, your work to the courthouse. Again, it was very important for us to get out into the community. Uh, we had a program called Community in the Courthouse where I invited the community into the courthouse once a month. Uh, they were able to go sit in, in these courtrooms. We encouraged them to be a part of it uh, and to really have them uh, be a part of the system because what we found is if the community didn't trust us, they acquitted uh, in cases where we thought they should have convicted. When I came to the state's attorney's office, we had about a 76% conviction rate. Uh, we went up to a 93% conviction rate. And that was only after we convinced the community that they could trust us, that they could trust our word. And this was really, really important. 
Um, now, after I left the state's attorney's office, one of the things you know now is that policy also becomes extremely important. Transparency um, is a problem that we have in Maryland. Uh, it is, again, it's the whole concept that there should not be two systems of justice. If I go to work and I punch and kick somebody, I promise you I will be fired before the day is over. And the same should be true for police officers. Um, that, you know, we had just last week an officer who was on tape at a gas station kicking and punching a person. And because of Maryland law, we were not able to fire that officer right away. We had to suspend him. Um, but it should be the case that if you participate in short, certain conduct, there should be no delay. Uh, in allowing us to remove officers from our force who should not be there. So in the case where you commit a misdemeanor, even if it's in front of everybody to see, uh, we're not allowed to fire that officer. And so we have to make sure that we address that and address the, the records that we seal, the records of officers who've been involved in all sorts of um, misconduct, the ones who we found, found again, were lying, uh, the ones who were involved in some sort of um, of sexual case. They, those are things that we shield in Maryland. You're not allowed to release items that are in a police officer's records. Uh, we did go to Annapolis last year, our chief of police did, uh, to try to testify to change the law. We were not successful, but there are so many laws that must be addressed. The ones that shield officers' personnel records, uh, the ones that disallow us from firing officers right away, the ones that disallow us uh, from talking to officers uh, when we need to. Um, within a certain period of time. And so we have a lot of work to do. Um, but again, transparency, accountability, and fairness uh, is what, what, what we deserve. And we have to continue uh, to, to reform this system until we, until we get it. That's, that's extremely helpful. I think it's important to acknowledge, again, that, that it is, has to be a relationship. Uh, several years ago, in 2016, we pulled together uh, whites, blacks, and officers in blue to say that this is something we all have to work on together. And that's when I began to learn about the complexity uh, of the uh, restrictions uh, in terms of trying to seek justice in cases of officer-involved uh, killings. Uh, and that these are all by jurisdiction. They have 18,000 jurisdictions across the country. And while we can do something at the federal level, a lot of this has to be done at the local and state level. Um, and that, that has caused people uh, in some quarters to start talking about defunding the police. I personally hold the view that that's really bad language. I, under, I think I understand what is meant by it, which is you need to reboot and reset by being able to take away all these restrictions. If you restart a department, you start with the tabula rasa, blank slate, and then you can build in laws and regulation that allows you to get uh, closer to justice. I think that the other part of it that concerns me, that language of defunding is, well, it, it's sort of like we can take this money from here and put it over there towards education and economics. Well, we just saw, you know, since the pandemic began, the federal government came up with trillions of dollars out of nowhere. And the Fed has said they're prepared to do more uh, and there's going to be more stimulus coming. And so uh, it's not a matter of a zero sum game that we have to defund in order to correct. And I think correction actually may require greater investment. So I just wanted to have uh, Brother Overton on the panel because he is president of uh, the Joint Center for Economic Studies and Political Studies. And so uh, I wanted to hear about the, the economic side and how this all plays into it, because I think it's important for us to clean up the language so we can get at what we're trying to get at and not create more confusion. Right, Reverend Watley. And I'll get to that. I did want to, though, thank you for your leadership of Kingdom Fellowship during this, especially during the pandemic. I mean, in terms of feeding people during COVID, supporting other churches by helping them with their tech so they could continue to have services, uh, ministering people across the country who, who don't have access to a church, really transforming lives, stepping up to the plate in a moment of crisis. And so, Thank you very much uh, for your leadership. Now, I actually heard Senator Harris on this question and she's very thoughtful. You know, we wanna recognize the perspective. There is a perspective of progressives in terms of AOC, Ilhan, Omar, uh, that says, hey, communities need investments. Many cities are investing a disproportionate amount of their resources, they would say, in policing. Uh, you know, nationally, that number is about four to six percent. Uh, but if you look at the general fund, it just ranges. So in places like New York City, for example, about 8% of local money 
is invested in police, whereas places like Detroit and Atlanta, about 30% of the general fund is invested in police. Uh, and, you know, the argument is, hey, maybe the police wouldn't be the best people to de-escalate a situation with the mentally ill, with the homeless, with someone who is inebriated, like Rayshard Brooks, right? Uh, and then there's also this political strategy I think they put forward, which would be unions don't have an incentive, police unions don't have an incentive to bargain for police reform, and facing cuts gives them an incentive to really uh, protect Black lives and support them. On the other hand, I think you've got some really thoughtful folks, and you know certainly you, you know you you articulated this very important point. Uh, you know, uh, Representative Clyburn, uh, Bass, who's the chair of the CBC, also a presidential candidate, Biden has articulated this, that this, this de defund the police argument is a distraction. It's divisive. It's easily caricatured by uh, demagogues. It seems extreme because it, it seems as though we're getting rid of the police. And right now in this moment, when you have many legislators where you want them, why would you alienate them with language like defund the police? So thinking about this notion of increasing the pie, uh, yeah, we've got to address policing and we've got to fundamentally reform policing because studies show that simply defunding the police doesn't actually get better outcomes in the places where it's been tried. Uh, it can't be the end of it fixing the police. We've got systemic racism and anti-blackness in various areas of, the lot of life, including the economy, uh, education, uh, and all these areas require spending. Experts predict that a third to 42% of jobs that were lost during the pandemic are not coming back. And black folks have been disproportionately hit uh, by that. And we've got to center black folks as we rebuild the economy in terms of spending. If we don't, we'll have a situation like with the GI Bill, where it was designed to lift all boats and create the middle class, but it actually increased racial disparities because black folks, by the way it was designed, were really uh, prevented from taking advantage of the, of the benefits. So we need public policies tailored to provide pathways and clear supports, especially in this new economy, when we think about the future of black workers, as you've mentioned, we spent over $3 trillion on the coronavirus uh, stimulation, uh, uh, stimulus. Uh, the, Trump, uh, the Trump tax cut in and of itself uh, cost about uh, $2 trillion. And compared to that, $80 billion for universal broadband so that all children can be educated during a pandemic and that all people can have access to work, it's not very much money. Five billion to secure federal elections like Senator Harris's bill does so that we have safe and accessible vote by mail as well as in-person voting opportunities that are safe and sanitary, it's not very much. A uh, real support system so that people can get workforce training, childcare, education, skills, uh, portable benefits for gig workers, since so many people are independent workers nowadays. We really need to invest in human beings. It's great to invest in opportunity zones or a, a casino and all that kind of stuff. But as opposed to that, we, the, the, the real focus needs to be on how do we invest in human beings? Too little has been done of that when we talk about Black folks and we want to invest in black communities. That, that's, it's so incredibly helpful because this really is uh, a challenge that requires us to be ambidextrous, that as we're focusing on one hand uh, on reform of policing that's effective and has been proven so, on the other side, we have to recognize that all these things are, are connected. But there's a reason that we find ourselves uh, in certain positions to begin with and, and the slippery slope begins. Senator Harris, you've been extremely uh, patient and, and we're all talkers for a living. So appreciate you uh, holding on to the end. But you've, you've heard the conversation, all these 18,000 jurisdictions. And I think it's so important that you, the work that you and Senator Booker are doing to provide a comprehensive bill, uh, the Civil Rights 
uh, Movement Produces Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act, the Fair Housing Act. These were large scale federal acts that from the top down sought to provide real redress for the country. And uh, certainly what the protests have done has provided a window of opportunity for us to make that kind of progress. Can you talk to us about some of the, the highlights of the bill and, and the work that you're doing right now? Pastor Wiley, I want to thank you for bringing us together with my most esteemed colleagues and friends. It's wonderful to be on a panel with all of them. And um, also, I want to thank Pastors Floyd and, and Elaine Flake for, for also the role of leadership. You know, the church has always been a place where we go um, in a moment of crisis, but also to renew our faith. And certainly, we are in the midst of at least three crises that are challenging our faith every day. And the church is always a place that centers us and, and, and focuses us on, on what justice looks like and how we go about doing that. Um, so I just want to thank you because right now we're in the midst of a pandemic, a public health crisis, as, as many have mentioned, where black folks have been disproportionately impacted both in terms of the number of deaths, but because also it has highlighted this pandemic, longstanding disparities in terms of access to health care. Mm -hmm. We look at the economic crisis that has resulted from the pandemic. And right now, in just the last 100 days, it is estimated that 50% of Black workers have become unemployed. You look at it in the context of education, knowing that almost 10 million students in America don't have access to broadband or to the technology that is necessary for them to learn from home, and that is disproportionately affecting our children. And then we have what is righteous, righteous demands for justice after the killing, the murder of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and so many others. And so I wanna thank you for bringing us together. So the, the, the piece of legislation that um, Senator Booker and I are leading on the Senate side together with our fellow Congressional Black Caucus uh, colleagues um, is called the Justice and Policing Act of 2020. And it would do a number of things, but it would do things that are specifically targeted to accountability and consequence for bad policing. So like um, Angela Alsobrooks and Spencer and, and Dr. Mitchell were talking about, there is a whole other piece to, to this, which has to be about reimagining how we achieve public safety, understanding that it is old, tired, wrong, status quo thinking to think you get more safety by putting more police officers on the street. When we know the reality of it is that when you go to upper class suburbs, you don't see that police presence, but what you do see are well-funded schools. What you do see are high rates of home ownership. What you do see are small businesses that have access to capital. What you do see is people and families who have access to healthcare and affordability is not, is not the issue. So we have to reimagine how we achieve public safety, understanding that the best way to do that is invest in communities, and in particular, the educational needs, the economic needs, the public health needs, mental health needs, and so on. Our bill does not do that. It's about accountability and consequence for police. So I'll highlight just about, I'll highlight three things about the bill. One, you talked about 1,800 jurisdictions. That's right, and as you know, I'm a former prosecutor. You've mentioned that. I was DA and then I was Attorney General where I led the second largest Department of Justice in the United States, second only to the United States Department of Justice. I know we need national standards around excessive use of force as it, when police officers exercise excessive use of force. So one of the things the bill would do was create a national standard for use of force and also not only require that the United States Department of Justice continue, take seriously the need for federal investigations of police departments that have a pattern and practice of, of, of discrimination. We would also not only require that that happen, but we would give the Department of Justice a civil rights division subpoena power so that they will have the legal tools that when a police department does not want to comply with their investigation, that they don't have to beg and plead for it. They will have a subpoena power to take it, to get that investigation going because they'll get the evidence. The other thing we wanna do is make sure that we allow attorneys general, state attorneys general to also have that power. So whereas in this moment where we have an administration under Trump and then Bill Barr so-called leading the Department of Justice who failed to take these things seriously, state attorneys general can pick up 
where they, they fail to act. Another thing that we are doing is requiring independent investigations. And again, I know of what I speak, and Angela also Brooks was an outstanding state's attorney in PG County. What I know is this, no matter how well-intentioned the prosecutor, the reality is that when it comes to the bad conduct of a police officer in a police department they work with every day, there will be at the very least an appearance of conflict of interest. And so we wanna get rid of that because that gets back to what Angela also Brooks was talking about in terms of the importance of the relationship of trust and a reciprocal relationship of trust between the community and law enforcement. So our bill would require independent investigations that it would not be that prosecutor's office that works with that police department every day that would investigate that police officer. And, and, and in that way, we can ensure not only actual justice, but the appearance of justice both of which are very important when we talk about relationships of trust. So those are some of the things, but I also wanna also mention, Dr. Mitchell was talking about, um, uh, about accountability around transparency. When I was Attorney General of California, I actually did the first time in the nation, and, and again, a state of 40 million people, the largest DOJ in the country outside of US DOJ, I broke open our data, including um, deaths in custody because exactly what Dr. Mitchell is talking about was happening. And people were trying to find out, family members were trying to find out why and how did my loved one die in custody? And they couldn't get the answers. Um, we, we learned as a result of exposing that data, we had a lot of folks who were dying of so-called natural causes, but it also begged the point, what is the quality of healthcare that we are offering incarcerated populations? And, and so this, these are all, the, the, the kind of things that we need to really reimagine what we are doing, but also to not just reform, but really upend some of these longstanding systems that have been, frankly, bankrupt in the way that they have been administering justice, meaning they've not been administering justice. And after all, that's supposed to be the point. Um, the point is supposed to be about coming steps closer to what is that ideal written on the the walls of the Supreme Court of the United States equal justice under law. So thank you, Pastor Wiley. Thank you. And um, I, I mean, this, this conversation is amazing. I think it's important, again, that the passion, the righteous indignation born from what we've experienced uh, through video has caused this moment for our nation and our world, for people's attention to be galvanized. But I think now we have to do the discipline work of becoming smarter, learning about our systems and learning how to engage. So I just want to throw this out to everybody because so oftentimes we talk shop and the person who's sitting at home is saying, great, you guys understand it and I'm starting to learn, but what can I do to help you in the fight? I've been on the street, I've been on social media, but there's something else I can do to help you. And so help me help you in the fight. So in, anyone who wants to jump in. And, and and let me matter of fact, let me do this. And sis, sister uh, sister Harris, Senator Harris, while you're answering, I'd also like to hear you talk to us about the importance of leadership in this moment. Uh, Thank you, Pastor. Not, yeah, we're not going to act like we don't know what's going on. So please. And talk. feel free to call me Sister Senator. <laughs> um, there is. This is a moment. I mean, this is a moment where everyone has to look in their soul. Um, look in the mirror, talk to their God about whether they are doing enough to speak out and to fight for the right for all people to be treated as equal. And in particular, this is a moment that yet again, like that moment when my parents were marching and shouting and mar you know, marching in the 60s, um, it's a moment for us to speak loudly as, as we have seen about the um, injustices historically that have, have really made clear that a black person's body has been considered less than human for most of the history of America. And we are seeing the vestiges of that and we need to acknowledge that and we need to speak truth about race and racism in America because we will not get to the point of correcting much less healing if we fail to acknowledge the truth. 
And, you know, even in scripture, you know, we have to shine a light on the path, right? Of darkness, if we're going to ever achieve a point of finding peace. And, and so that's, that is important. The leaders must speak truth, no matter how uncomfortable it makes them. And they must be prepared to listen to truth. Um, leaders must be prepared to sit down and listen to the activists, to the members of and the leaders of Black Lives Matter. Leaders must sit down and talk to the pastors and talk to the, to the civil rights leaders who've been fighting for decades for justice in America. Um, and, and then we must commit ourselves, not just to those conversations, because frankly, conversations have been happening, but leaders, real leaders have to act. And so our Justice and Policing um, Act is one of those things that we must pass. And I would urge everyone watching this to be in touch with your member of Congress in the House side and your senators and say enough is enough, the time has come to say that we should have get closer to one system of justice in America instead of what has been happening, which is that there have been two systems of justice in America. And as a side note, I'll point out that when Michael Flynn can get off after he pled guilty, when you see what is happening with all of these people who, if they have access to power, get off, they're walking the streets, um, we have to fight for one system of justice in America. So let's do that by insisting that our members of Congress act the right way and vote the right way. Let's also be sure we register to vote and go to the polls. And you know, I hear folks when they say, Kamala, look, I've been voting and I'm not seeing change. I understand that. But if we don't vote, we will not see the change. And so everybody's gotta be able to vote. Like Spencer said, I've got a bill that's about vote, voting safely. I urge people to vote by mail. That is a very respectable way to honor the ancestors who fought and died for our right to vote. Um, but if you have to go to the polls, demand that you have safe voting, like curbside voting. Um, and, and, and ultimately, let's just keep marching mm -hmm. until the day comes that we truly have justice for all in America. All of these things are necessary. Very good. So Pastor, I wanna jump in as well and say, you know what, so there's something I want people to do for me. And that's not to aim too low. You know, we talk about the police, but what I want people to recognize in this moment as we talk about a social justice pandemic is that there are inequities that happen long before our young men ever see a police officer in terms of the inadequate education that they're provided, in terms of the uh, lack of health care access, healthy foods, all the things that we saw during this pandemic, don't forget it. Don't forget it. And we will have missed the mark if we leave this moment and we only talk about the relationship between the police and our communities. And we don't talk about all of the other ways that our community has been destroyed even before we ever met a police officer. We will have totally missed the moment. So if you ask me what I want you to do, I want you to raise all kinds of cane. When you go back to your local jurisdictions about the education of our children. For example, during this pandemic, we know now, I am so concerned about the achievement gap that I know will grow. Over the summer, as our kids have been out of school for six months, don't miss it. Don't miss it. Insist the individuals as a senator saying, hold your, your representatives accountable. Ask them what's going to happen to our children over the summer, the ones who can't, who don't have the technology to continue to learn over the summer, where the camps have been canceled and all kinds of other things have been canceled. What are we doing to make sure that every day of every week of every year, we're asking the question about what are you doing to make sure that our kids are prepared for the future? So we, we have to, to really attack it on multiple levels. And again, if we stop just with the police, and this is a concern I have, this is not it. This is not all of it. There are so many injustices that happened long before, the ones that have made us sick, the ones that made us die at disproportionate numbers and during COVID crisis, that caused all of us, like Prince George's County, the wealthiest majority black county in the country, Yet yeah, we had those co comorbidities here, and not because we're not educated, it's not because we don't have uh, the, the disposable income, it's because we didn't have access to health care, even in a county like mine, where we didn't have not only the medical professions, but we begged people to bring their businesses here. So you know what? When Senator Harris and all of the others have provided um, support, and they have to businesses who will rebuild, for example, after COVID, let's ask them, please, after we have supported them, to please support us and bring those healthy businesses into communities like ours so that we can be healthy and live too. And so as we talk about this moment of justice, justice is so far reaching and I just don't want to undershoot. I don't want us to, to, to stay in a place where we're just attacking one part of the problem. It's multifaceted 
And so please, let's make sure that we understand the range of inequities that keep us in this position. And, and that's, that's what I would ask. And then one last point I wanna make, uh, something else we said, as we talk about defunding the police. I think the true term is probably realigning, making sure that our funding really aligns with the priorities of our community. Uh, but there's one important point. For those who think we're taking away, when we take away funding, we ask of the police sometimes more than they're qualified to do. Police officers are not able to go into our communities and ask health professionals. They're not there and able in many instances to help those who have addictions. And so that funding has to go uh, to make sure that we're supporting those efforts. For example, here, 70% of the individuals that we arrest every day and take to our Department of Corrections are intoxicated when they arrive. More than a third of them suffer from mental health care. So if we realign dollars from our police budgets and send them to places that can help us to deal on the front end with mental illness, can help us to deal with those who have addictions, then that's not defunding the police. That's just doing what makes good old fashioned sense, saying police officers are not equipped. And in many cases, they're, because they're not equipped, they do a horrible job of it. Get out into the, they're not able to handle situations that we can handle better if we realign those resources to make sure we deal with those situations before they encounter police. Sure. And that, that's so important because what, what you all are doing are framing for those who are watching the opportunities to, to engage regularly besides just, so we have to vote, we have to register, we have to participate in the census. We also have to show up at every local board meeting the same way we show up for football games and cookouts. If we knew the stats of morbidity and mortality, like we know the stats for our local teams, then there would be a different level of accountability from local politicians all the way up uh, to the national level. Uh, my grandparents taught me people do what they want to do. And the extent to the extent to which we have the focus on the things that really impact our lives, the opportunities to engage uh, will, will present themselves. Uh, let me hear from the brethren as well in terms of, of how you see persons that are watching that can, uh, that can engage. Yeah, yeah, preachers have a whole different parlance. We really do. Uh, just building on your, your points, Reverend, uh, both protest and policy is essential here. We need both an inside and an outside game. So this means, you know, calling your member, calling your member of the House or a senator, uh, and not just saying, oh, well, that person's uh, part of the other party that I didn't vote for, they're not gonna listen to me. You know, call your member, that person represents you and be engaged with them. They need to hear from you, right? Uh, and as the county executive mentioned, you know, policing really just illustrates this deeper piece. And, you know, uh, Reverend Sharpton brought it up during his eulogy of this notion of get off, uh, get your knee off of our necks, right? There is this systemic uh, problem issue in terms of anti-blackness that we see in the economy, that we see in education, that we see in healthcare. If you look at implicit bias data, it's all over the place. So being ready, we'll, we'll get this done in terms of policing, but being ready to move on to these other areas of systemic structural bias and attacking them, and then also can't uh, underestimate the importance of a vote. Certainly in federal elections is incredibly important, but also in local elections, turnout is way down compared to uh, federal elections. You know, Ferguson just elected its first black mayor, despite the fact that black folks were uh, a significant percentage, a majority of the population. So many of these decisions in terms of policing, education, economic development are made on the local level and being engaged in local politics in terms of voting protesting, et cetera, engagement is critical for our folks. Absolutely, and, and people have more tools in their toolbox than they realize. That most people are watching this right now on social media. Instead of just putting up inane memes, put up policies that are gonna affect people that are really gonna make a difference. That the same way you can pick up somebody to go to the club or go out to social distance in the open air, you can pick up somebody and go to the board meeting and see what they're gonna do with your child's education. And so really, it, at the end of the day, it is about us also having some sobriety and focus in terms of, of our own output. 
that we have a voice that we have to learn to use. Uh, I'm old enough to have to see blackness go out of style and for blackness to become something other than excellence. And now that we're having this reawakening, I pray that as we awaken, we find our voices. And as soon as we do, we will see what to speak to and the number of areas and opportunities that we have. Uh, Reverend, I mean, Dr. Mitchell, well, Reverend Dr. Mitchell, go yeah. ahead. No, I, I appreciate it. And, and, you know, I wouldn't be a good DC employee, DC resident if I didn't talk about DC statehood. If you're looking for something to do, um, we need statehood, we need representatives uh, in Congress and in Senate. Um, so we make our, our mayor proud by talking about statehood. But what you're talking about, everybody's talking about is the social determinants of health. Um, education, economics, housing, healthcare, criminal justice and environmental justice issues all lay the groundwork of how healthy a, a community is going to be. And so all that is the basis of living long and prosperous lives. So the policies that are used to ensure that we have access to those five major areas that W.E.B. Du Bois talks about is critically important. And you know, my message is really to, to our healthcare providers and our physicians that we don't abdicate our responsibilities uh, as physicians because this is a public health issue. Violence is a public health issue. I've been talking about these social determinants that lead uh, to the tip of the spear. This tip of the spear is law enforcement force, but there's a holder of the spear and there's a full spear. And that full spear is uh, the inequities that lead to um, the visibility of law enforcement force. You know, in 1851, uh, there was a physician that diagnosed drapedomania. Drapedomania was this concept of a disease that made slaves run away from the plantation. And he reported that in a, in a journal and that journal was peer reviewed. And there was a concept that there was a disease for runaway slaves. In 1919, um, during the red summer and lynchings occurred all over this country, the coroners in those lynchings said that they did not know the manner of death for those individuals who died at the hands of law enforcement and other uh, community members um, of our uh, white brethren and sisters. Um, there is a history and culture of the killing system, systemic killing of black men and women in this country. Um, there's institutional racism uh, that is pervasive. And I think that our physician groups, our AMAs, our NMAs, um, and our physicians, our local physicians and community can do a lot. That white coat means something. And so if we mobilize as physicians to understand that this is an issue that's affecting the health of our community, we add additional per perspective uh, to this work, that it's not just a criminal justice issue. It's not just a social justice issue. This is a public health issue. Um, and so, you know, I would say to, to our Senator Harris that, you know, adding medical legal death investigation to that independent oversight on deaths and custody is critically important because this case is going to come down to the science of the compression of neck. And it's gonna be the physician who's on the stand that has to answer the complexity of that for a jury. And it's the coroner systems um, out in places where you do not have to be a physician to establish cause and manner of death in this country. There's inequities depending on where you die and what community you're from. And so there's an opportunity to your point, to the points being made here to reimagine what our country looks like in all aspects and to fund completely um, those types of things like death investigations that goes woefully underfunded in most jurisdictions. So I appreciate being on this panel and be part of, uh, of this conversation. I also appreciate being the last, last word on the panel because uh, as a medical examiner, we're often the last uh, to go uh, in life. So thank you so much. And for the record, uh, I understand prosecutors always want things to be in and on the record. For, for the record, where did you attend undergraduate school? Um, I went to uh, the Mecca and there is only one. Uh, that's Howard University. Is that a fact? Yeah, amen. That's good to know. Bless amen. you. I think yeah. I was the last man. Uh, I'm appreciative of this because these are highlights of what can be done. 
But as I said before, people do what we want to do. Here's how I explain it as a pastor, as we get ready to close. And as a pastor, you know, I get to close three times. When I'm trying to encourage people to give and to tithe, I encourage people to tithe by saying, make tithing a priority like you make getting an outfit a priority, like you make getting a new car a priority. Once you prioritize something, you figure out, you become creative in figuring out how to get to what you want. Once we decide that we've had enough, then each of us, whether we're doctors or lawyers or mechanics or any place else in the community, we will figure out for ourselves how we can impact. And so one of the things we have to do is to respect leadership, but not place the onus of all responsibility for change on leaders. We lead as far as folks follow, but at the end of the day, it is really about the power of the, of the masses. And so I'm grateful for this moment. I'm grateful for you all's time. I'm grateful for the mayor of the District of Columbia uh, for her paint job on 16th Street. I think it is awesome. And I know that somebody has a major problem with it and it makes me all the happier. I am concerned, uh, second close, that as we find ourselves in this moment, we have someone who shows themselves readily on a daily basis, unfit for office, who seems almost committed uh, to division, even at the point of race war, uh, to try to maintain power. I am concerned uh, that he continues to foment uh, uh, violence uh, by, his, by his words uh, and to do violence by his policy, uh, by leaving the states to fend for themselves during the pandemic. Literally, there's blood on the streets. And so uh, one of the ways that you affect policy is by those who you elect. And so for, our, for everyone who has posted something on social media or gone out to the streets to protest, your work isn't done until you show up in November. And so I wanna thank you all uh, for your time. I wanna thank you for your contribution, for your fearlessness and leadership is never easy. Uh, you always will get the blame. And so whenever you can take the credit, you might as well because you're gonna get blamed for some stuff you didn't do. Might as well take the credit for the stuff you didn't do. But I'm appreciative of this moment and for you all's leadership. So thank you very much. And I certainly will be praying your strength and will be ready to assist in any way that I can. Amen.